Okay, we are recording. I am Brandon Polite, Associate Professor of Philosophy at Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois, and I'm joined today by Stephen Hales, who is a Professor of Philosophy at Bloomsburg University of Pennsylvania in, surprise, surprise, Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, Stephen, in addition to being a philosophy professor, is the series editor for Wiley Blackwell's This is Philosophy book series. Uh, so Stephen, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Cool. So we're talking about your paper, which is, I guess, forthcoming presently uh, in the British Journal of Aesthetics called Value Pluralism and Restoration Aesthetics, where you're talking about art restoration and artifact restoration. Right. And in the paper, you advocate for value pluralism with respect to restoring artworks and artifacts. But before we can get into the pluralism, we need to know what the values that are pluralistic are. And so can you just talk us through what you think the main values of restoring artworks and artifacts um, are, and then we can get into it? Sure. Yeah. First of all, I think that when people are interested in restoration, the first thing they think about is monetary value. That's not what a restorer can really aim at directly. And the reason for that is that the fluctuations of what people care about changes over time. So you can't really say, well, I'm going to do this to it and it's going to make it more valuable. Well, maybe 20 years from now, having made that kind of a change, people don't care about it anymore. It's now made it less valuable. They don't want to see that. It's So this sort of thing changes dramatically. And frankly, fluctuates considerably among the kind of artifact or the kind of art object that we're talking about. So we need to set that aside and, and realize that financial value just can't be the main driver here. So the three types of value that I think are salient to restorers and the three that they care about. Now, I, I'm talking about the restoration of artifacts, and I'm setting aside natural objects, the restoration of a fossil, let's say, or of a forest or um, historical sites, the Gettysburg uh, battlefield, it, that's a different kind of a thing going on. I'm not entirely sure what to say about those sorts of examples. Uh, I mean, I have a couple of ideas, but so the, the three kinds of value that I think restorers are concerned with are, first of all, relic value. And relic value is a broad umbrella that will incorporate things like Benjamin's idea of an aura, uh, Regal's idea of age value, but not exclusively that. I think there's also an epistemic component to relic value. Things that we can learn from that particular object that we couldn't learn in any other kind of a way. So, for example, if you think about the Rosetta Stone, the we can learn the propositional content of the message on the Rosetta Stone in a book right? You don't need to look at the actual object to figure that one out. But we can't learn what it is made of, which is granodiorite, unless you're actually looking at the rock itself. And we can't figure out facts about its quarrying, its origins, uh, this sort of thing, again, without that actual physical object. So there's an epistemic component. Now, I don't think that relic value necessarily requires great age. I mean, I think normally we think of antiquities when we talk about relic value, but uh, people try to make specific objects, if not unique, special in some kind of way. That's what relic value is. What makes a particular object special in some fashion just as an object? So if you think of let's say, limited editions of books. Okay, they're trying to make them special in a certain sort of way. In fact, I recently saw that there is a crowdfunding uh, opportunity for the graphic novel version of Good Omens um, by Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett, where there's all these different tiers and there's more and more goodies that make that tier special the more money you pay in until uh, I think the, the very top you would be a character in it. You're like your face would be in it and you'd be a name, but it was like some stupid amount of money. But, you know, there'd be various signatures or trading cards that were unique and this kind of thing. But this is all trying to give it relic value, even though it's something that's brand new. Non-fungible tokens, I think, are the limit case of this. 
we're, we're trying to make a digital object uniquely special somehow. And whether that works or not, you know, separate topic. Okay, so on, on the one hand, you've got this idea of relic value. <clears throat> and then there's aesthetic value. I mean, traditionally, how beautiful is this thing? I mean, if you are restoring a painting, a, a statue, are we making it more appealing to look at, to enjoy? And that is clearly distinct from trying to maintain its uniqueness as an object. Like, let's say with a painting, uh, if you have a lot of paint that's worn off or scraped off or damaged in some kind of way, okay, well, maybe we're going to do some in-painting to repair that. Okay, well, that's not increasing its relic value or, or doing anything about that because we're actually adding new stuff, brand new materials to the painting. But we're making it more beautiful as a result. And then finally, there's practical value. Now, this, I think, comes up very clearly when we're talking about objects like the restoration of an automobile, of a book, of a building. But even if paintings and statues, you've got to be able to look at them or they don't have any kind of practical value at all. But if, let's say, you're restoring a classic automobile, if you can't drive the thing down the road, you didn't do it right. I don't care how beautiful it looks. I don't care how many of the original parts you've preserved or how many, you, you know, uh, how much new old stock you found and put into the restoration. So the practical value also has to be there. Same thing with the restoration of buildings, right? You've got to be able to go into the building, use it, live there, whatever, for it to count. So uh, what I'm interested in is the balance among those three types of values. Yeah, and you talk about it in terms of like turning up the dial, right? That you could turn up the dial on practical value and leave the other two alone or turn them down in particular ways, right? And so when you're restoring mm -hmm. an old book, for example, or attempting to preserve an old book, right? That you can really crank up its aesthetic value by, you know, it had a crappy cover that had, you know, fallen apart. So you can bind the book with, you know, leather bound, sort of tooled and gorgeous, ornate um uh, cover in the way that you yourself make as a professional or semi-professional book binder, right? Um, or you can, you know, leave it alone, right? And, you know, if you leave it alone, maybe the book is unreadable, whereas, et cetera. So could you actually talk about your experience as a book binder as it relates to this? Sure. So I've been interested in books as objects and the restoration of books for a pretty long time. And when I was in grad school, I had an old copy, a uh, limited editions club copy of Frankenstein, and the spine was coming off of it. And I'd picked it up at a local bookshop in Providence for a cheap. And I didn't know what to do. And I started, started to ask around, and I found out that the university had a hand book binder on staff, and maybe this guy could fix it. So I went and you know met him, and we had a nice conversation. He said, you know, I offer private lessons on book binding in my home. He had a home studio. I'm like, yeah, I'm interested. So I wound up studying with him for two years when I was in grad school and learned hand book binding. And I've been doing it ever since, um, which, I mean, it, it, it's really a lot of fun and it's a challenge. <clears throat> and I think I'm finally starting to get the hang of it a little bit, but, uh, but you're entirely right. So if you're given an old book, cover's fallen off of it. It's dilapidated. Okay. If you're interested in preserving the relic value of this thing, you'll make a box, you'll put it in the acid-free box and it is preserved. The original glue, the original dust, the water stains, they're all still there. Right. Um, but it's not, maybe not practical because you couldn't read the thing. You couldn't look at the prints or the maps it might have or anything like that because it's so frail. And it's not particularly lovely if it's stained and fallen to pieces. Okay, so so what are we going to do here? Do you want to make it, is readability your only concern? Is that, okay, we, we can put a buckram binding on it that's going to be very sturdy, last for a nice long time. You can flip through it. That's not too pretty. Okay, do you want to make it beautiful? Is that your main object? Well, how much of the original parts of it do you want to preserve? Um you know, maybe it had a very nice original, but now severely damaged binding. Can we do something with that to preserve it 
and improve it and now make it beautiful once again. You know, there's a lot of variations here. Um, and there's no recipe for, okay, here's definitely what you should do. Yeah, it's sort of, um, you know, your interest is the restorer, right? Your beliefs is your store, what you think you're, you know, particular, particularly good at. But it's also, you know, especially if you're dealing with a, a customer, right, who owns the thing, right? right? It's sort of ultimately up to them. Now you can discuss and negotiate with the person, you know, how they want the book restored or how they want the painting restored or how they want the car restored, um, to just give a couple examples. Um, but ultimately they could be like, yeah, I know you think I should do this, but I'm going to do this, right? I have this old car. I really want it to run well. And so we're not going to source original parts, right? We're just going to build a whole new engine for this thing, right? Um, for example, and yeah, yeah. It, I mean, is there a sense in which, okay, in doing that, they're failing to preserve the relic value of the thing. And some thinkers think that that's the primary value. It's the relic right. value. Um, you know, uh, Carolyn Korsmeyer argues, you know, in, in favor of that view. And because there's a particular aesthetic experience that comes from being in the presence of this thing, which relates to, you know, Benjamin's notion of aura, which you mentioned earlier, Right, but it's you're in the presence of this thing, you can touch this thing, and through touching this thing, you can imagine yourself as being in touch with the past, which has a certain sort of thrill or frisson, right, as, as the aesthetic dimension of it. Whereas if you, you know, replace the engine entirely, build a new engine for an old car, right, say a relatively rare car, right? Like that sense of being in touch with the past is diminished when you, you know, take it to a car show and open the hood and everyone's like, this is a brand new engine. What did you do? Right? So there do seem to be some norms and conventions with respect to how these things are preserved or how these things are restored. But ultimately it is the owner's uh, decision as to what they're doing with this object that they, it's their property. Yeah. It's very interesting because in bookbinding, for instance, there's a lot of discussion among binders about how far you should accede to the client's wishes. Because if they want something that, if they have a 500 year old book and they want you to do something that you think goes against, you know, proper binding standards, you know, it's like, no, I I'm not going to do it. I mean, it it's sort of like plastic surgeons who are like, no, I'm just not going to do that kind of a thing that you want. You know, that is unsafe and or whatever. Uh, but it's a similar kind of phenomenon where you, you want to say, ah, I'm just not going to do that. And the car example that you brought up, it's pretty interesting because I've noticed that there seem to be two kinds of car collectors. On the one hand, they're the people that want original everything or as original as much as they can get away with, right? It's really relic value that they're preserving. And then there are those that are interested in both the aesthetic qualities of a restored car and in its practical value. And I'm thinking particularly of Restamods, where someone will take an old car and they'll intentionally put a brand new engine in the thing. They'll put a new chassis on it. They'll, I mean, all kinds of upgrades where it's safer, faster, better in every possible way. And you know that if these materials and techniques were available 100 years ago, 60 years, they would have used them right? Because it's, it's better. And, you know, somebody who has a 1957 Bel Air that is as original as possibly can be, and somebody who has a Restomod Bel Air with a new engine and new this and new that, you know, they go for about the same price, <laughs> right? So I think really representing that as far as the market is concerned, there's not one clearly better way to do it than the other. That's really interesting, right? And so the sort of roughly equivalent monetary values tracking different values, right? In the one right, case, right. it's the preservation of the original to the specifications of the <clears throat> original versus I'm going to, you know, trick this thing out to make it as safe and awesome and, and practically drivable as, as possible. It's more like a new car as opposed to how a car would have been 50 years ago or mm -hmm. whatever. And I guess, you know, one thing that leads to is a metaphysical question, right? Regarding, you know, sort of a ship of Theseus type thing, right? Where after sure. so many replacements, at what point does the car cease to be the car? At what point does the book 
cease to be the book? At what point does the painting cease to be the painting? And this isn't something you go into in the paper, but do you have thoughts on that side of the equation here? I mean, I wish I had something original to say about the ship of Theseus problem and other identity problems. I mean, look, I totally agree with you that it's absolutely an issue. And I guess I've been struck by how far people are willing to ignore that. I mean, so here's an example, and I should have written down the specs on this. So I could say it exactly, but a, I want to say a 1954 Ferrari just sold at auction. It was in a wreck. It had been on fire and then a building fell on it. Okay. So it was, the whole thing was about as destroyed. I, I mean, if you saw a picture in your local newspaper of man killed in wreck, that's what this car looked like. I mean, it was like absolutely crumpled. It sold for 1.3 million, something like that, because some maniac is going to, some maniac rich person is going to take this thing, have it completely rebuilt, specked out, it, you know, the whole, I mean, I understand it's a rare car, obviously incredibly rare, but there's very little of it left. And most of what's going to be on that thing will be new parts. It'll new metal. It'll have to be. Um, but I, there wasn't much discussion of, well, is it still the 54 Ferrari and this and that? Well, they just, I don't know, kind of um, ignoring that. It's interesting to me. Yeah, right. It'd be somewhat similar to someone uh, just taking the original specifications and using all new materials to build one, right? And we call those things right. replicas, right? They right. are not originals. Right. It may be to precisely the original specifications and it may drive exactly like the car originally would have driven back, you know, 50 years ago, 70 years ago, whatever, but it's a facsimile. It's a replica. It's a reproduction. Right. It's a reissue. It's a new edition, right? Right. Uh, right. Of the thing, and those things entirely lack relic value. That's right. Yeah, they completely lack relic value. Although what's interesting too is I, I think it's a perfectly rational and reasonable choice to prefer that kind of a thing. If you're talking about replicas of handbags, watches, automobiles, where they could be sturdier, better made, better built than the original. I, I mean, better paint, you, you know, ju just as reliable, um, more reliable. They're new. They're made out of new materials, you know. And to think, why would I spend an insane amount of money just to acquire the relic value as opposed to this just as beautiful object that's even more practical? Now, I mean, I am no way dismissing relic value. I absolutely get the attraction of it. But I also see the other side of this, too, that, uh, you know, maximizing aesthetic value or practical value, I mean, that, that seems like a reasonable choice. Yeah, right. And so I collect records and uh, I don't typically buy reissues of old records. I want the old the old ones, right? I want the originals be, be precisely because of they have relic value, right? Um, but, you know, so so for example, one album that I really want is Funkadelic's Maggot Brain, right? Okay. But getting a first pressing of that in mint condition <laughs> would cost well over 200 bucks, you know, probably into three, $400 territory. Now I could buy a reissue <laughs> for like 25, 30 bucks, maybe. It sounds better. It's 180 gram vinyl. Right. So it's going to play better. It's going to last longer. I'm never going to spend that money to buy the original. And so I just sort of have to hope that I, you know, stumble across a perfectly preserved copy at a flea market or garage right, sale right. or vintage shop where the person doesn't know what it is that they have. Right. Um, and so, but, but it's precisely like the relic value of these things of, you know, being in touch with the past of using, mm -hmm. you know, an outmoded technology for music. Like, I guess that's like the most hipstery I get, um, <laughs> but it is, you know, that exact thing. Right. So I, I totally get where you're coming from here. Right. And what I think is interesting about that is. I didn't see this coming. I didn't expect people to want to collect vinyl. 
But now that they do, I get it because digital copies of things, you're not getting the relic value. And if you want to be a collector, you can still collect the digital things like I've got all of Charlie Parker, you know, that kind of thing, right? But it's all digital and you could go get all of Charlie Parker tomorrow just as easily because there are now infinite copies in the digital world, right? But if you think I want more to my collection than that, even though the aesthetic value, let's stipulate is the same or even better. Uh, well, if you want the relic value, you've got to go back to vinyl or you've, you know, the old 78s even, right? Maybe that's that's where you're headed. Maybe wax cylinders, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you know how hardcore you are but uh so i think the interests of collectors which is another topic i'm actually interested in intersect with these ideas about preservation and restoration yeah absolutely and so one thing we haven't really talked about yet is the pluralism side of this right you've introduced mm -hmm. the values and then i took us on a detour um but why should we be pluralistic about this right you have some people um, you know, Benjamin, Ruskin, um, Korsmeyer, who think relic value is the main value, right? And so, you know, you let the ruin ruinate, right? Or you mm -hmm. preserve it in such a way that the ruination is going to take a longer amount of time, but we don't want to, you know, rebuild the castle, right? Or anything right. of that sort. We just want to leave it alone, whereas other people... Uh, you know, may think that, no, 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 it's the practical or aesthetic value. That's the thing that should be of primary attention. And so why should we be pluralistic when thinking about preservation and restoration of art and artifacts? Yeah, I think the answer is this. You're absolutely right. There's plenty of people that defend relic value as the primary value that we should care about. But there are also people who defend aesthetic value as the main thing that we should care about and people who think that practical value is what we should be caring about. In fact, the interest in practical value is responsible for the continued existence of a lot of monuments that would have crumbled to nothing if people didn't think, hey, you know what? We can still use this thing. Let's shore it up, right? I mean, if the Pantheon hadn't become a Catholic church, what kind of state would it be in now, for instance? All right, so... I, I think that all three are legitimate values worth caring about and worth promoting. But the problem is, so I guess you might naively think, well, let's just set the levers to maximum on all three of these, right? Let's. The problem is that that is an impossibility. So if you think about concretely how restoration would proceed, you just can't. I mean, it's just not possible to maximize the relic value of a thing and its practical value, and it, and its aesthetic value, we're going to have to make some choices. Because as soon as you think, well, let me just take the in-painting example again. Well, it's going to look nicer if we fill in this scraped off patch. Okay, well, now we're adding some new stuff. I mean, so we're increasing the aesthetic value, we're diminishing the relic value. All right, how about I've got a map, maybe a 400-year-old map, but it has a huge water stain in it. Okay, well, I can wash that and make it look like it was made yesterday. Okay. But the stain was part of its history, right? If if you care about that relic element of it, keep it with the water stain. It looks horrible with the water stain. Come on, you know, don't it, right? And the same thing is going to be true of practical value where, you know, we're going to have interventions to make a thing useful again, even though, I mean, we were talking about cars earlier. You know what you don't want to drive? A car that has 60-year-old tires on it. Okay, well, let's get some new wheels on it. Well, now we've, all right, you see how it goes. So a restorer has to think about what is the balance of values that we should aim at? And what are we trying to do here? So in this sense, it is an aesthetic choice about, well, we're going to be promoting this or we're going to be promoting this. And maybe it depends on the kind of object that it is, the desires of the owner. And I think also sort of the cultural norms that are in effect at the time. Yeah, right. And so, um, you know, one example that that I thought of that I mentioned to you before we recorded was Willie Nelson's guitar trigger, right? Which he's been playing for, I have no idea, I would guess well over 50 years. 
Um, and you know, when he gets it restored or preserved, right, it's the fretboard that'll get swapped out. It's the frets that'll get swapped out, you know, stuff having to do with the neck, maybe the tuners will get changed. Obviously strings are getting changed constantly, but that's, you know, similar to tires with cars, you know, they wear out and you need to replace them in order for the thing to continue, uh, be it, you know, working as it's supposed to work. Um, but, uh, you know, he's worn an additional sound hole in it, right? So acoustic guitar, like this guy right here, you know, has a sound hole in it. Thanks to him mm -hmm. playing it, you know, there's an extra hole right here underneath this, <laughs> okay. right? And that could be fixed, right? But Willie mm -hmm. Nelson wants that preserved, right? And he's had all sorts of people sign the guitar also, and he doesn't want to, you know, the finish sanded off and the signatures removed, you know, so you could restore it to pristine condition, but right. that's a part of Willie Nelson. <laughs> and if you restore it to pristine condition, then you've lost that history, even if it's, you know, by and large, the same mm -hmm. object made of the same material. Right. What's also interesting about that example, and you mentioned the signatures, the signatures when first added, were adding something new to that relic, right? And now we regard them as part of the relic and part of that history, as opposed to, I don't know, an unwanted intervention, like some graffiti guy just came by and tagged it with his gang sign. You're like, I didn't want that on my guitar, right? You know, Jimi Hendrix, okay, he can sign it. That's a different scenario, right? Um, so we kind of change our minds or change our tune uh, about that over time. Uh, what Whether it is changing the aesthetic qu quality of the item or changing its relic value. So, I mean, I, I feel like that kind of shifts. Yeah, and bringing up graffiti, right, um, on ancient buildings for example there's often ancient graffiti which at the time right, was right. probably unwelcome or you know it, it was 500 years later or something that someone graffitied it but still that's 2000 years from us and so we, we we think of it as being a part of its history whereas you know the american tourist who just defaced uh the Colosseum in rome right like carving in his and his girlfriend's initials right like right. that we want to get rid of even though it is part of that building's history, yes. right? Because yeah. it's a modern, it's a contemporary intervention as opposed to it's an ancient intervention. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. Even though if those initials were to remain for another 2000 years, maybe in the future, people will look back at that as, as part of its important uh, journey through time, I guess. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so uh, I guess somewhat related to that, right, you talk in the paper, uh, you compare sort of Western attitudes towards restoration and, and, you know, aesthetics in general to Chinese attitudes. So could you briefly talk about that? And then we'll talk about stuff that relates to it. Sure. Yeah. So there's in the Chinese tradition, there's this idea of Shanzai or fakes, which is a kind of platonic view. So let's suppose uh, you know, we take some painting, all right, and some modern artist does a forgery of that painting, but makes it even better, makes it more beautiful, makes it more true to what's being depicted in some kind of way. Then the Chinese view, to as far as I understand it, it's actually better. It, it's better altogether. It's It's superior, like someone would swap their old master to get the new thing because it is closer to the platonic ideal of what that painting can be. This, I think, sounds insane to the Western mind, right? Like, I don't want that. I want the original Van Gogh, you know? I I, I, I don't want some new modern Van Gogh guy. Who, okay, I really do like what he did with Starry Night, but I, I want the Van Gogh. All right, that's not the Chinese view. And this absolute privileging of aesthetic value, I think is very interesting that relic value just doesn't mean very much. And I do wonder if that's part of the reason why so many high-end fakes like watches, handbags, that kind of stuff come out of China. I mean, that there is that culture of tradition of this is actually better. Yeah. This is better than the Swiss watch that costs 30 grand, right? You can get it for 400 bucks. Like, 
Right, right. Works just as well, you know, only if you open it up, maybe, and, you know, look through a microscope, you could see that, you know, the teeth on the gears are slightly different and maybe worse, but in general, it works just as well, if not perhaps in some cases better. And so why wouldn't you buy this instead of the original, right? And in that case, right, right it seems less the relic value of the Swiss watch because they're not exactly relics yet, unless you're talking about one from, you know, X number of decades ago, but it does seem more like the prestige thing, right? That it was mm -hmm. made by this manufacturer. Uh, and so that's interesting. Right, right. And, or th think about cars when we were talking about before, maybe it's not that old, but you know, um, do you remember the Ferrari that was driven in Magnum PI? Of course. Hey, okay, good. Apparently the engine in that was a piece of junk. All right, by modern standards. Okay, well, if you own that Ferrari from 1984, you really want to swap in a brand new engine or you want to preserve that Ferrari engine? I mean, you might think the that thing was garbage. You're never going to be able to repair it without spending a fortune. I'm putting in a brand new LS7 and this thing's going to run like a champ. Okay, and but that's kind of more the Chinese view. <laughs> Let's do that. Yeah, right. And it's also interesting to think about, you know, at the time where people replacing the engine or improving sure. the engine, which presumably people were upgrading. Yeah. If oh, not. absolutely. Because it didn't matter then. I mean, it was just an old race car engine. I'm going to put in this new engine that's even better. Yeah, right. And so in a sense, by replacing the engine, you're doing precisely the sort of thing to it that people would have done originally with it. Yeah, no, that's true. You know, and I was actually thinking the Shanzai idea about approaching the platonic form of an object i think it may even be clearer when you think about musical covers and i know you're interested in that and, and interested in music where sometimes the original version people don't even remember who did it you know <clears throat> i mean i gather that when aretha franklin recorded respect i mean you probably know who originally wrote it right yeah o otis redding yep I, I think a lot of people don't know that Otis apparently heard her sing it and said, well, I don't own that song anymore. It's not mine. Yeah. Like she just took it and now it's her thing. I mean, how many people could name the original composer of Hey Joe? Exactly. I mean, you think of the Hendrix version and everyone subsequently who plays it like Hendrix, which is it's the ideal version. The original version's terrible. Yeah. All right. So why not think that I'm not interested in the relic version of the thing. I'm interested in the perfect version that Hendrix did, you know? Yeah, right. And so there's this distinction that happens in, in, you know, Western art practice between the plastic arts and the performance arts, right? And so with music, it seems like we, because it's performative, because it's something that unfolds over time, we're more comfortable saying, no, this is the actual version of the song. This is the true one. This captured the essence in some particular way. Uh, as opposed to with with plastic arts, right? That, you know, painting, et cetera, right? Like anything else is a forgery or else a copy. And because it's a forgery or copy, meaning that the original artist didn't touch this canvas with their brush, for example, right? Or their chisel didn't touch this marble. It is therefore deficient, right? It is demoted to, you know, it's a knockoff maybe a really good knockoff. It may have made some improvements, right? If they weren't mm -hmm. trying to just preserve the original image, for example, of the painting, we may even like it better, but mm -hmm. it's worth monetarily way less because it lacks relic value in that case. Although what, what's funny about that, and I was thinking about Roman copies of Greek statues. Okay, now that's something that's going to have a lot of re relic value. Maybe it's a 2000 yeah. year old statue copying a greek statue that was 500 years older than that maybe the greek statue doesn't even exist anymore right so it it has gotten that relic value over time it's no longer dismissed as some okay this is some cheap knockoff that i just made yeah right so i guess that relates in the paper you talk about van Meegren's um uh, uh forgeries right of vermeer mm -hmm. and other dutch masters Right. You know, I do think over time that his paintings are going to be, you know, put in museums and they probably already have been exhibited. Right. Even though they're forgeries that were meant to, uh, uh, you know, saturate, I guess, the um, financial, the art market. Right. And, and make money for him in the process. Right. But now it's like people, 
you know, they were so good that people thought they were the real thing and they thought so right. for decades. Right, right. No, that's exactly right. Um, and it's pretty funny because he had sold one of his paintings to Hermann Goering, and then the Dutch charged him with selling cultural treasures to the Nazis after the end of World War II. And that's when he finally had to say, uh, yeah, I didn't sell cultural treasures because actually I did it myself, right? And then they're <laughs> like, well, then we're charging you with forgery. <laughs> and, you know, the point that he made at his trial, which is, okay, yesterday this painting was worth millions. Today it's worth nothing. What changed? Well, he's, you know, he's got a pretty good point there. I mean, it's just as pleasing to the eye, just as nicely composed, just as elegant, just, you know, just as beautiful as it was the day before. It's just the relic value. You know, what they thought was a really high relic value now went down to zero. Uh, which I think is interesting because it puts the lie to what I think is a naive view that art's appreciated for its beauty. Yeah. It's just not true. You know, not not solely, solely true anyway. Yeah, and further, right, it goes against the idea of like the innocent eye, right? It's it's the eye, you know, that's we see this, we're unbiased. We look at it, we see its beauty, right? Well, no, it's a way more complicated affair than that. And it's our background knowledge and beliefs and attitudes about the artist and the historical context and the practices, et cetera, that inform how we see the thing and whether it's viewed as beautiful or not, right? It's interesting that, you know, you you look at the thing, you think, wow, that's beautiful. But then once you find out, oh, it's just a forgery, right? Like, oh, gross and, and in that sense it's sort of the background beliefs and your moral attitude is shaping you know the beauty that was once there just immediately uh uh disappears and that relates i think to the relic value of things and you're talking about you know you get an old map what do you do with it do you just put it in an acid-free box and people can look at it do you attempt to restore it in some way get rid of the water stain to make it look more like it would have looked back when it was first made and mm -hmm. You know, that relates to the section in the paper where you talk about patina, right? And the patinas of things indicate their age, which then amps up their relic value because we feel like they're old. And it relates to, you know, this idea of making new things look old, right? As a way of, you know, enhancing that sense of, of being in touch with the past, which I think Kors Meyer is absolutely right, is an aesthetic experience and an aesthetic value. Um, and you don't talk much about patina in the paper. So I'd just like to invite you to say more about that because I think it's super rich and interesting to think about. No, I, I agree with you. I think patina is very interesting. For one thing, there are some objects where no one wants patina. They're not interested in it at all. In fact, the more patina you've got, the worse it is. I've got a friend who's a comic book collector and he collects original comic art. They want those things to look like they were printed yesterday. I mean, they don't want it looking like somebody's been thumbing through it for 90 years. <clears throat> and the same thing is true for coin collectors, stamp collectors. You know, I mean, they don't want the paper on the stamps to be all brown with age or, you know, have, you know, spots and stains. And that, they want it to look brand spanking new. Okay, but that is clearly not the case for collectors and many other kinds of objects where patina is seen as this desirable trait. And I suppose that would be true in the case of fine furniture, uh, partly true in the case of books. It, it's, it's complicated because if you have a crumbling binding on something, no one thinks wow, that's got a lot of patina. I'm really, <laughs> that looks, you know, that that's the kind of thing I want. But if you have something that is well-preserved in the practical sense, it's not falling off, uh, let's say uh, pigskin. So pigskin was commonly used in the 15th century um, and early 16th century as a binding material. It's hard to work with, honestly, but it lasts forever. So if you had something bound in pigskin, and now the pigskin is weathered in a certain way. It looks like this kind of veiny, dirty marble, but it, I mean, it's well-preserved. That's a pretty attractive thing to have as opposed to the rotting, disintegrating binding where you want to say that doesn't have patina. The one thing does, the other doesn't. I, I don't know how you parse that exactly, but or why in some cases it seems like a desirable trait and other examples, it's not. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting, right? That in some cases with like furniture, for example, if you refinish the thing, right? Uh, you know, so long as the original finish didn't look terrible, but it did show its age, right? If you refinish the thing, the value decreases significantly, right? Because people buy the thing because it's antique. And if it's antique, they want it to look antique. Yeah, uh, that is true. But I think the caveat that you offered is very important. How bad did it look to start with? You know, if it looks horrible, then refinishing it is not going to diminish the financial value of it. Because, yeah. you know, you're making it more beautiful, right? And, th and that's one of the things that I was trying to say about how what people find financially valuable changes with the whims of fashion. You know, do you want it to look new? Do you not? Do you want, you know, all of that kind of thing. How important is patina on what kind of object and to what extent? You know, it's not an eternal, uh, eternal thing. Yeah. So I guess with the refinishing of antique furniture, right, in a sense, you want someone to do it who knows what they're doing and who you know presumably you're not just gonna like oh this is an old desk or old table i'm just gonna paint over it right i mean you could do that and it may look nicer in a certain respect the relic value and probably the financial value decreases unless again as you mentioned it was in really horrible shape to begin with but typically you're going to want to restore it in such a way that it looks like new right in, in terms of it looks like it did when it was first Right. New, right. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, I mean, are you, what do you, it, it gets tricky when we talk about objects that have had an extremely long life and have looked like different kinds of things. What age do you want it to represent? So I'm thinking about the restoration of the Acropolis, for instance. Yeah. Okay. So do I want it to look like it did when it was new? I don't know. They put up a lot of stuff after that, you know, that maybe I'd like to have there. Right. Okay. Do I want it to look like it did 500 BC first century AD? I, I mean, what are we going to pick here as here's the ideal appearance of it? I don't know. I, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, that's awesome. And so earlier we talked about, um, you know, Chinese aesthetic practices and attitudes, right, towards objects. But there's also, with respect to preservation and restoration, there's Japanese aesthetics, right, where when you restore the thing, right, say the clay pot has broken or a clay vessel of some sort is broken, you know, you could attempt to restore it such that all of the cracks are hidden and no one can tell that it was broken. But you could, you know, do the practice of kintsuki, Sugi, rather, sorry, I'll say that again, of <laughs> Kintsugi, of, you know, using gold paint to showcase the damage, right? That here are the original pieces, they have been damaged, and we're going to highlight the damage, and it's going to transform the object aesthetically, and, you know, by highlighting the imperfections, it could make it more beautiful in a certain way respect right this ordinary vessel now it is you know these veins of gold sort of throughout it um and so you don't talk about you know that practice or japanese aesthetics in the, the article but what do you think about that yeah no i think that's very interesting because there is that kind of transformation of a thing and the idea that the damage to it the cracks are now part of its history we're highlighting those, but at the same time, trying to increase its aesthetic value, right? We're trying to make the thing more beautiful by using gold powder, right? It wasn't just, well, I'm going to get some clay and just work that in and we'll call it a day, right? But but trying to increase its beauty. And I know that there is also a Chinese tradition of treating paintings as a kind of palimpsest where subsequent owners will put their seals and their marks and their signatures on it. And so it becomes this kind of multi-generational conversation. And it seems to me that that's a similar kind of phenomenon where we're adding to the thing to highlight its journey through time. And I think maybe that's what's happening in Kintsugi. And maybe what's happening when, you know, we were talking about uh, Restamods with cars. You're not hiding it, right? I, you know, I mean, I've got new seats in the thing. I'm not trying to disguise it. 
you know, but I'm I'm making I'm taking this thing and I'm trying to make it more beautiful in a way that either is highlighting those changes or at a minimum not disguising them. Yeah, right. And so when you're thinking about, say, restoring paintings, right, um, you know, depending on how much paint has flaked off is in a sense going to help to determine how you do it, right? And how much in painting or how you in paint, right? If they're just a few chips of paint missing, well, you could leave them there, right? And maintain the thing as a relic in a sense, or you could fill them in, right? They're just tiny little imperfections here and there. And you can, uh, you know, in paint so as to not draw the viewer's eye to them such that what they're paying attention to is the image that the artist produced. And so you're preserving that as the object of aesthetic attention. Um, but in cases where a lot of paint has chipped or flaked off, right? In painting then becomes, I'm sort of making a new painting here, right? I'm putting a yeah. new painting on top of and next to this painting so that viewers um, think that it's the original or may get the impression that's the original when in fact, you know, half of this painting was done by me, the restorer. And I know that in painting restoration, there is this practice of not completely in painting in those cases, but instead, and it obviously it's going to depend on negotiation with the owner, right? The owner just might want you as a restorer to paint the damn thing in. And then you as a restorer have to decide, well, am I okay with this? And if so, I'll proceed and take the money. But if I'm not, I'll say, you know, find a, another restorer to do this for you. But there is this practice of instead of in painting it completely, just doing like really fine lines of paint in sort of roughly the right color so that the viewer is getting the impression of what the artist was, you know, the, the original image right. while not disguising that this is an addition, a manipulation by a restorer of a later period. Um, and so that yes. sort of relates to the, um, kintsugi right of we're not going to hide that something has been lost here right that the damage has been done but we are going to highlight it in a particular way while still preserving the original to a certain extent and i don't know why you just wouldn't leave it at that stage and say you know here's how the object is there's not much we can do but some mm -hmm. restorers will do that i know and, and some um owners will just be like, yep, I guess we'll do that because I want to, you know, showcase the original to the extent that I can. Yeah, it makes me think of what the common standard is in book binding. So if typically if you rebind a book, I don't know, two, 300 years old, you'll bind it to the style of the time. There's exceptions for people that want some really extravagant, crazy, you know, but spectacular modern design. But for the most part, I mean, you know, if I'm binding a book from 1720, okay, using a Cambridge panel design was very traditional then, calf skin would have done that. So you're drawing attention to that period of the book, but no one is going to think that it is an original 1720 binding because it's too perfect, right? It's not worn enough. It's not scratched or flaking or, you know, so you'll know. So it's sort of like the Kintsugi thing because you're drawing attention to a particular aspect of it. Namely, this is what the book would have looked like in 1720, even though we all know going in, this is new work that's that's been done, even if it's spectacular work. It Would it be deceptive to um, distress the book binding, right? You, you rebind it and then you distress it, you scratch it, you chip away at it to make it look older and so you know i guess if you're trying to pass it off as wow look how well this book was preserved over the last 300 years like in that sense you're that is a forgery of a certain extent but if you're just distressing it in the way that you can distress blue jeans to make mm -hmm. them look worn when in fact you've never worn them before no one has um is that deceptive or problematic or unethical or is it a, a i guess thing I that someone could do i mean i wouldn't think of that as being deceptive because, again, you'd have to be pretty naive not to know that it is a modern binding that's made to look old. Maybe, a, you know, I've kind of scraped the gold a little bit so that it doesn't look perfect. You can, you know, so it has that uh, faked patina on it. But I don't think, I mean, if you presented it as, well, this isn't actually a 300-year-old binding on it and, 
okay, that would be deceptive. But if, if you're just making it to look like one with that intentional distress, then, then I don't think so. I mean, I, yeah, there are binders who can restore old bindings in a way that you can't tell at all. I mean, this is, there's a binder in France named Julien Jacques. He's the best in the world at this. His, I mean, let's say you've got a, a book with the head cap at the the top of the book. They are often are damaged because people grab them like this to pull them off the shelf. He can replace one of those and you cannot, I cannot tell. And I am a book binder. I've had him do work for me because I can't do it to his stand. I mean, it's just unbelievable. I mean, so I don't feel like there's something dishonest about that. I mean, it's still the original binding on it, but here's a kind of small restoration, but it was done seamlessly and perfectly. Um, yes, yeah, so I don't think anyone would look at that. Well, all right, there there was some, some kind of fakery going on here. I, I don't know. If I clean the dust off, was that fakery? I mean, <laughs> you know. Yeah, exactly. Okay, I think we'll leave it on that note. So Stephen, thanks so much for joining me. This is a really fantastic discussion. Yeah, no, thanks so much. It was fun. Awesome.